Never mind. Off we go again. What is the improvement? Should the improvement be left to others? We, we often think it's really for the large scale beekeepers. Obtaining good bees, if you're a beginner. What quality do we want in our, what qualities do we want in our bees? The partnership between bee and beekeeper. Subspecies and hybridization in bees. The, the starting position that we find ourselves in at the moment. Difficulties in selecting and breeding the honeybee and the importance of drones, simple queen rearing and achieving more control of mating. Actually, that's ne in next week's talk. So we're not going to go too complicated this week. And conservation and bee improvement, is there a conflict? So what I need to do is get rid of my picture here. That's it. So a good place to start is, is what happens in nature. Look at what happens in nature. After all, humans haven't been around very long and certainly not in what we call an unnatural way, which is really when we started uh, to mold nature to our needs, uh, the beginnings of agriculture, which is that, that stage. And that was only a few thousand years ago, really. Before that, we were hunter-gatherers hunter we are largely part of nature and we're just another part of nature and since then we've been molding things to suit ourselves. So what happens in nature? Well species evolve through the process of natural selection. This has been going on for millions of years and even in the honeybee it's been going on a long time and the aim of any species is in nature is just to survive and reproduce so that the species keeps going and everything is geared up for that really survival and reproduction and without those the species disappears if they fail so over time populations become locally adapted to their environment they mold themselves to their environment through again through natural selection <clears throat> the most successful ones survive and reproduce and any that struggle disappear and that's um, in bees that eventually has led to different regions developing their own subspecies of honeybee and you probably know there's about 28 something people argue about how many but about 28 subspecies of honeybee and they're all developed they've all evolved to suit a particular region or climate um, I just wanted to mention how important genetic diversity is to a species in their survival um, and it makes them much more robust. So whatever um, threat comes along, it might kill some of them, but it won't kill all of them if they're genetically diverse. There'll always be some that are resistant to the problem and they're the ones that can go on and reproduce. And we have to remember that in our beekeeping as well. Um, it's an important factor. Now, when it comes to agriculture, we've, as I say, we, for a few thousand years now, we've been selecting plants, selecting animals, and picking out the ones we like, ones we, and breeding those, and helping different, you know, we've got all the different breeds of cattle, for example, all the different breeds of sheep. And that's because we've developed them in different areas to suit that particular setup and all these different things have developed. <clears throat> so we modify organisms over time in agriculture. Beekeeping, people argue, or we can still argue, we're dealing with a wild animal here. We're, it's not a domesticated animal, but the important thing about beekeeping is it, it is a partnership between the bee and the beekeeper. Both should benefit to make it sustainable. Um, so the qualities we need in our bees are ones that will benefit us both. They'll benefit the beekeeper and they won't be detrimental to the bee. The bee will still prosper and thrive. So, um, and perhaps even more important than the bee, being the beekeeper, the net beneficiary is the environment and agriculture. As we, it's always been pointed out to us, that is worth far more than the yield in honey, for example, the value of the honey produced. 
So that's just a side effect of, of us keeping bees, but it's a very important one. And these days, <clears throat> quite a lot of people are happy to keep bees just for those reasons, because they know it's so good for the environment and for our food production, in fact. And we've got sort of on the one extreme, perhaps you've got natural beekeepers and on the other, you've got highly commercial beekeeping, which is out, you know, they want to make as much as they can out of their bees. On the other hand, the natural beekeepers maybe think, well, I don't care if I don't make anything out of my bees, uh, as long as it's good for the bees, good for the environment. So you, you've got to weigh up all those differing interests. So who should practice bee improvement? And some people say, well, I'm not really that bothered. I'll let, let someone else do that. Or they might have the reasons for not wanting to modify the honeybee in any way. And we could just leave the qualities for nature to sort out, <clears throat> uh, which it will. It will sort them out to suit itself. Nature, as I say, will pick the ones that survive and, uh, and reproduce. But if we think, well, we're not bothered what quality they've got, it implies we have no preference for attributes such as the temper of the bee or the health of our stock. So we're not bothered if they're really unhealthy. We're not bothered if they're stinging everybody who goes near them. And really most of us are, obviously. We, if nothing else, we like a good tempered bee. We like them to be healthy. So there's always some quality, I would argue, that in bee improvement we would want. So where do you start? Well, it depends on assessment and selection of desirable qualities. So we start really with thinking, well, what qualities do we want in our bees? And we monitor our colonies and assess them for those qualities. And we, to make progress in bee improvement, to get the qualities you want, um, you breed from the better bees and you replace the worst. And that's a simple rule of selection of any animal or plant. So should we leave it to the large scale beekeepers who have much more influence on, on their bee populations than we do perhaps. Um, if we've got two or more colonies though, I would argue you've got, you can make a choice. You can, um, well, you might think this one's much nicer to handle and work with. It's a pleasure to work with. And this one is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, every time I go near it, I get stung or whatever. And uh, you might think, well, I'd, ra I'd rather reproduce from the nice tempered one than the bad tempered one. So as soon as you've got two or more colonies, you're in a position to make a choice. What about if you've got one colony? Well, one colony is where most people start. And, and it's generally reckoned that's not the optimal number. Optimal number. You'd want to at least the unit would be two colonies and perhaps a spare hive. And then the idea of having two colonies that if one dies, it reduces your risk really. If one dies, you've still got one left to carry on and you can build up to two again. Um, so one colony is great. You can certainly, there's nothing to stop you learning about the techniques of bee improvement and start assessing your colony, see if it's got the, the things that you will look for in your bees. What about if you've got no colonies? well, you've got to decide where to buy your bees. And you want, um, you want good bees, but we don't know where to get them. We go on the internet, click away and buy, buy a colony of bees and see what turns up. But you've got to remember that all bees aren't the same. And I'll try and explain that in a minute. Um, um, with bee improvement, you can always, you know, if you have only got two colonies, yes, you can make progress because you've still got the choice of two different queens. Which one would you like to carry on to the next generation? Which one you like to reproduce? Um, but you can make more, achieve more by working in groups. And I'll say more about that later or maybe more next week, perhaps. Um, that's an important point um, because several of you can get together and pool all your resources. You still have your own bees in your own garden, whatever, but you can compare notes and decide between you which ones are nice to breed from and so on. Right, uh, that's a prime problem. I can't see what that says. I've got a load of stuff here. 
Anyway, how do we obtain good bees, I think it says. <clears throat> a common practice is for suppliers to buy in queens to make up nukes. And we think, well, that's fine. That's their job. That's what they're doing. And we'll buy them, click on, click on it and buy it. Unfortunately, these are usually from foreign subspecies. People, who sit, a lot of bee suppliers uh, buy in queens quite cheap from abroad and they can use them to make up their nukes with their small colonies for beginners and sell them on. And I don't think it's a good place to start personally because they're not adapted to our, our environment. They're, there are biosecurity risks with importing bees. We could be bringing in different pests and diseases. There's no local adaptation if they come from abroad to a different, completely different climate. They've never seen anything like our conditions here. Uh, there can be problems with different subspecies crossing with each other. That can lead to problems with temper. And it make, if you've got a hybrid, it's more difficult to select and improve. Some associations do a good job producing queens and dukes for new beekeepers. And that's got to be highly recommended because they can um, breed from the ones that are doing well in their area. And that's a really good start. So if you're lucky enough to have an association doing that, that's one step ahead, I think. The first requirement for most people is good temperament. And of course, that these are often good tempered. That's their big selling point. They buy bees, Italian or something, and they come in, put them with some nu a nuke, and then they, they can advertise them as being good temper. But what happens when they cross with the local bees is another story. And it, the good temper doesn't often last for more than a couple of generations. So we've got to think about what qualities we want in our bees. And the first quality we want, which we don't usually pay much credit to, is that they survive. What's the good of buying a nuke of bees for a couple hundred pound? And then the first winter that comes along, they don't survive. And if you're a beginner, you think, oh no, what have I done wrong? But actually you might not have done anything wrong. It might just be the bee, you were unlucky enough to have some bees that weren't very well suited to your area and your conditions. Um, so we can't, do much about that, except um, what I like to do is, if anything doesn't survive, I don't go out and buy new colonies to replace them. I try and replace them from the best ones that I've got, because I know they do well in my area, in my conditions. So that's that's the what, how I deal with survival problem. And I, I look for good temperament in my bees. I like them to be easy to handle, handle and a pleasure to handle. Um, I'm just putting, I put question marks on these because these are just some suggestions, really. And these are things that I look for, but you might have completely different lists to me. Um, <clears throat> most people I talk to have this one, but one or two people I've heard saying, no, I'm not bothered about that. Um, so I'm just putting out what I do with mine rather than what you've got to do with yours. So I look for bees that don't swarm too frequently. If they, as a bonus for me, because then it, if a colony goes through the season without swarming, it produces more honey. Um, that might not be an issue for you. I like them to have good health, a good brood pattern, and overwinter well. So when I come to look at them in the spring, say April, and it gets warm enough, I go and inspect them. And I'm not very pleased if I see them coming through the winter on one or two combs. You like them to see that um, good solid a lot of bees um, ready to take off as the weather improves. Take off by expanding, not take off flying away. Um, and I like them to be good honey producers. So all those things feature on my record card and you can design your own record card for assessing their qualities according to what you want. Or you can borrow a record card that we've put out, Bibber has put out, um, as a template and you can adjust it to your own needs. But I'll talk, talk more about that later. So it's important to have a, get a record card for us assessing these qualities. And we, we don't often talk about this. Nearly always people, when they're on about record cards, they're on about uh, the management of the bees. But this is quite different. This is assessing their qualities. 
uh, which I don't think enough of us do really. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, I don't want to go off too much of a tangent, but as I said before, we have a lot of subspecies in the world. We have about 28 that evolved in Europe and Africa and the Near East. And they all evolved to suit certain circumstances. There may have been a bit of geographical isolation over thousands of years and so on. And when we start crossing them, and we, we have crossed them a lot, <clears throat> um, it gets difficult. I'll try and explain that a bit more in a minute. The regional range of the subspecies, that's what we, if we go back to about 1850, before we started moving many of them around, we'd already started taking bees to the Americas and Australian places, but, <clears throat> and we may have brought bees into Britain. Uh, the first recorded one was 1859, but it's possible there were more, some before that. And these different colors represent the different subspecies. And the whole of Northern Europe had one type, Apis mellifera mellifera, and this was a millifera by Iberica, it's a Spanish one. And the, these two are perhaps the most important in the world of beekeeping. That's Ligurian and that's Carnica. That's their original territories. And these two now have been taken all over the world and they do incredibly well, good honey producers, especially in warm climates, which is mostly where the honey is produced. In a way, we're on the fringes of beekeeping in some ways, because we're our production is lower than a lot of warmer countries, but nevertheless, bees can thrive and do well in these conditions. <clears throat> so as subspecies evolved over time, and that's perhaps not so important, but there were four main lineages or families, if you like, and it was all to do with their evolution. Some are thought to have migrated up here and across here, and that's one lineage. Some were thought to have migrated around the eastern Mediterranean and that's another lot and some went up this way and so on. Anyway, we won't go into that right now. <clears throat> they all evolved to suit different climatic conditions and that's the Italian bee and that's the Carnica or Carniolum as we often call it. And they're those two which are, you know, the most important worldwide. But uh, few, I don't know if I should mention this now, perhaps I should. A few years ago, there was a group set up to look at colony losses in Europe called the Colos Group. And um, they, one of the things they were quite concerned about was how these two subspecies were more or less largely taken over everywhere, the whole world. And they were worried about, we're losing our biodiversity, we're losing our genetic diversity and all, losing all these subspecies. And it's quite an interesting point. Now, uh, some people like, they particularly like crossing one subspecies with another because they get the advantage of hybrid vigor. Um, and Brother Adam was a great fan of this. Um, and it, hybrid vigor is some, a technique very widely used in agriculture, plants and animals, and it produces really good results. F1 hybrids, well, if you, when they start becoming popular in this country, probably the sixties and seventies, um, they used to put on the seed packets, do not save seed from this variety. Because the reason being it won't breed true. In other words, the, the plants that grow from the, the off one hybrid aren't gonna be the same as the, your, the one you planted, the F1 hybrid you planted. The F2 generation is not the same as the F1 generation. And that to me is one of the problems of this system. Um, you get great results in the first generation, but thing with honeybees, things can deteriorate afterwards. And it's no big secret and it's no, not something I've made up. It's something that brother Adam recognized. Um, things degenerate after a while into a random mix and queens mate with the numerous drones from the area. So we're getting a more and more mixture. Uh, the more bees we bring into the country, the more mixed up they get. You get random hybridization or probably more accurately mongrelization. And Mendel demonstrated it with his experiments with peas and so on. Um, <clears throat> he showed that you cr cross two distinct parents and you get a nice F1 hybrid variety it does something good. And then the next generation uh, are not reliable. 
so it's difficult to get any consistency into your breeding or improvement programs. And this is just something taken out of a Brother Adam book, uh, Breeding the Honeybee. It's just one of the classic diagrams associated with Mendel. I don't think he did them, but after his time, based on his work. And you see, this was just one different gene crossing with another. And you will already see quite a mixture coming out. And when you've got numerous genes crossing each other, you get tremendous mixing up of the organism. <clears throat> So queen breeders generally discourage the mixing of strains, apart from, as I say, buckfast breeders, but even they like, they like the pure strains to start with, to cross. And they, they, they don't want to mess around with mongrels, they want a, a pure strain to work with. And there's Brother Adam, and uh, that's me listening to what he's got to say many years ago. And he, and I asked him about, you know, how to get good bees, and. His thing was you buy in a buckfast queen and you can rear some good stock from that and it'll keep you going for a while. And when the tempest, you know, the qualities start deteriorating, which they will after a generation or two, then you just go and buy another buckfast queen in to top them up and make them good again. And, uh, and it works for many people and people like it, especially commercial beekeepers like it because they get very good results and they're happy to do that. <clears throat> Um, I wasn't very happy with that answer myself. I prefer to develop something in my area that's going to be good, not keep buying in stock from elsewhere. <clears throat> in Germany, after the war, they had a big queen or big bee breeding program, and they've carried on to this day, but they focused on selecting and improving one race of bee, the Karnica bee, which was not actually their native one. It's just to the south of Germany, the native area for that. But they uh, replaced everything they could with this and they achieved great results and they stuck to that one breed of bee and that's how they did it. So buckfast bees, I think you get de de deterioration over the generations as we all, we're all subject to a bit because we're surrounded by hybridized bees at this point in time. <clears throat> um, I'm having to guess what these slides say. Well, I can't. So anyway, we'll just carry on because I can't see the top of my screen. Um, breeding within a strain or within a subspecies, what's that all about? Just to, this is a Christian quote I stumbled across recently out of this book, <clears throat> which I found very good. It's uh, recently translated from the French, I think. And he put, selection is the only possible, only possible within the framework of a well-defined population. For example, within a given race or a fairly large local population that will be disrupted as little as possible by the introduction of foreign bees. And I think that's the clue really. If we're going to make any progress in bee improvement, that's where we've got to start by starting with what we've got locally. <clears throat> that's not going to satisfy everybody because it's, it's not a short term fix. Unlike buying in your top rated, top bread bee, that gives you an answer straight away, albeit one that is not sustainable and you have to keep repeating the process. Right, um, this is uh, some work that was done um, a few years ago <coughs> by some DNA analysis from bees taken by the ran random apiary survey, which bee inspectors were doing, they kept the samples from around Britain, well, I think there's many England and Wales, but there may have been some from Scotland as well. Um, and they analysed them and tried to assign what percentage of the bee was to which bit of uh, which subspecies, if you like. And this is quite, I don't know how accurate it is, but it does give it some indication. This is our native type bee, Apis minifera minifera. And these were various other different types of Ligurian or Italian bee, various carnions and so on. And it's quite surprising that this, this bee, our native bee, had such a big proportion because we'd never really paid it much attention. Very few people had paid it any attention and it had to survive for itself despite all our imports year on year. But the point is it's a very mixed population. That's what we're starting with. Now we can't turn the clocks back and I don't think we'd want to, to be honest. If we put the, wanted to turn the clocks back to 1850 and we probably just had these, that's all very well, but the 1850B 
faced a very different environment to what we face today. The agriculture was completely different. Even the climate has probably changed a bit since then. It's, it's gradually warmed up and so on. So the bee then is not going to be the bee we need now. So we've got to try and find a way to move forward from this position. We've either got to bring in stock or start from what we've got. That's your choice. Um, now, there's good arguments for both, but um, I'm, I started from the point of, right, I've got these bees in my area. Um, I'm gonna try and improve them. It seems a bit of a long shot, but how are we going to go about it? And we, the first thing is to view the bees in your area as your resources. They're what I've got to work with. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. They're all very mixed and how are you gonna make anything of it? The queens will make with any drone in the area, so that's another issue. So they're gonna make with perhaps up to 20 drones or maybe more. Um, so you're getting a real mix of genetics, which is can be a good thing because we want that by genetic biodiversity or genetic diversity. Um, so that the bee is quite well designed in that respect to avoid inbreeding, which is a good thing. Um, now, if we're working alone, just a handful of colonies, we can still make a difference by choosing which queens produce offspring, as I said before. And the offspring being, the important offspring, should we say, being the queens and the drones. The workers don't breed, so they're useful to our colony, to our honey production and everything else, but they're not part of the breeding. And the way to do it is assess the qualities of our bees by using record cards. It will tell us which queens to rear from and which queens perhaps we should replace. And I've already said that, but I think I'm not talking about that today particularly. But anyway, here's a, a record card that's available on the Bibber website. You can download it. There's two versions. One is a download as a PDF. One is a download as a, uh, as a Word document so that you can modify it to suit your own needs. And that's the important thing. This is going to be, or is, yeah, this will be used in the, in the Bee Improvement Programme, uh, the National Bee Improvement Programme. Um, so we're not exactly dictating what people have got to do, what qualities you've got to, you've got to select for. You choose your own. You choose how you do it, basically, but we're just keen that you do it. And we're keen, well, more about that later on, maybe more next week. Um, this top box is just um, purely a sort of housekeeping box. Um, your name, if you're working in a group, the colony origin, or it might have been a swarm from 2018 or something, or it might be a queen I reared last year, who knows. But I'd put that in as a use, it's interesting information. Um, name or number of strain. If it's one I reared myself, I can put down what the, I give the strains a name. Originally, I started giving them numbers, but it's much easier to give a strain a name because you remember it better than a, a random number. <clears throat> and the, if the queen's a breeder queen, if she's one I'm going to rear more of, so I'll give her a name as well. And then all the offspring from her will be, will carry her family name, if you like. Uh, if the queen's marked, so if she's last year's, she'll be blue, was it? Yeah. Wearing, yeah, blue last year, I'd put a B with a circle around it if she's marked blue. And that tells me how old she is. And I, I could put a description if she's a dark queen or if she's stripy or yellow or whatever. I can, uh, if you happen to lose one in a swarm and you, you pick up a swarm with a blue queen in it with a description, you probably can work out where she's come from. Um, Apri name, hive number, and I usually stand behind my hives and uh, Number of them to the left, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So they all, I know exactly what position that hive is, if it's number five, uh, what type of hive it is, if it's a national or something else. But this is the important bit. This is the actual day-to-day -day use. Or every time I inspect them, I fill in one row. This is last year's. So if it's a queen from last year who went through last season, I've got a record of what she did, and I'll just... I won't go into that too much now, but I've got her summary for how she did last year. And oh, when it comes to 
the new season. Um, I'll record how, when I go into them, say April time, I'll record how many combs they were on. And I'll probably average out the April and see what the average for the April was and give her a mark. If she's stronger than average, everything's marked out of five. So I'll probably give her, if she's much stronger than average, I'll give her five for overwintering strength. And I'd record what treatment I give her during this season, what for her treatment, if any. And if I liked everything there and, I, and she's come through really well here, I'd probably think, you know, rate her as a possible breeder and I'd put a mark in here. Anyway, let's, I'll have a quick look at this. I don't mind spending a little bit of time on it because people get overwhelmed by uh, seeing a big form like this. And it's not too difficult because this is all that's interesting to me. Right, here we go, 15th of April, so it's a nice sunny day. Uh, bees are happy, they're out gathering some sort of pollen. And uh, so I put my initials in there. It might be me, it might be one of my assistants who are doing it, so it's good for that. That's inspected by that short for. This is the colony size. Um, I wouldn't expect, well, I mean, some of the big ones, uh, by middle of April, they could be a super zone or a super on something, but um, more likely they're still in the brood box. I'll put whatever it is. If it stands on seven frames, I might put 0 0.7 as an approximation. <clears throat> of how big that colony is. I might put, if there's on a brood box and half a super, I'd put one plus 0.5, for example. Brood in all stages amount. So there's um, five frames of brood. Uh, it doesn't tell me much because there might be loads of brood on the coma, it might be little. So I can put, I've started doing a small, medium, or large amount of brood. Uh, so I'd average, if there's a lot of brood on the comb, I put large. So five frames, a large amount of brood. That would give me, so 5L would tell me there's loads of brood. Uh, native appearance, no, you might not be interested in that, but that's all part of my breeding within a strain, um, which I think you can make more progress if you can stick to a strain of bee. And so I'd put, if they look all uniform and all look like a native bee, and I'll show a few photos later to what I'm looking for. It might not have any importance for you, but I'd put five if, it, if they all look good. Uh, if they're really lovely to handle, well, that's, this is marked out of five. So the best way to do this, <clears throat> come up with an answer, I think, is to say, are the bees good or bad, you know, nice or horrible to handle? And if they're really quite nice, it'd either be, you start with four, then you can round it down or round it up, according to how good you think they are. And if they're really docile and lovely, or gentle, whatever word you want to use, you put five. They're virtually perfect for five. Or if you thought they were quite nice at first, but they're, there's the odd sting, or they're not quite as good as you thought, you perhaps round it down to three. <clears throat> and if they really weren't very pleasant from the word go, you'd start with two and then think about one or one, two or three. And you can soon come up with an answer. Now it's April, um, swarming propensity, unlikely to see any signs of swarming. So I'm not gonna put anything in there. Very unusual to see anything at all in, in April that would make me, but say I come along in May and uh, there's some swarm cells starting to be reared, I would then have to note that. I'd have to give them a, a mark down basically. Uh, they'd be going down because they're, they're trying to swarm. So that's not a good thing. And if they go through week for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I got to July now, and they, they've built up a big colony, they haven't attempted to swarm. They produce a nice crop of honey. That's perfect. I'd give them five because they haven't swarmed for the whole season. And so that's, you just mark them when something happens basically. So you don't have to fill in every box as you go. Brood pattern and health. Now, that is quite important because if it's healthy, if the bees are healthy and the brood's healthy and the brood pattern's good, you can be sure they'll build up nice and strong quite quickly. If there's things wrong with the health, perhaps there's some chalk brood, uh, it will take much longer to brood build up. They'll never be quite so good as they would have been if everything was healthy. But if the queen hasn't got a very good brood pattern, she's a bit erratic. It's just going to not be quite as good as 
That's perfect. And you can give them a mark. <clears throat> Sometimes you see a slab of brood, which is all the same age and it's all solid. And you think that's wonderful, you know. Uh, I might, might go into this to this week and not see that, but it just depends on your timing, how you catch it. And if you just see the queen's got that lovely laying pattern, I just happened to caught it in this week and it looks perfect. A solid slab of brood, so then I'll give it some good marks for, for brood pattern. Uh, if I take any honey off through the season, I'll record it and estimate how much. You can do it how you like. And I, if I feel to feed the bees, I'll record that. Gradually through the season, you build up a good picture of what they're like. And you, you know, if they're if they're really good, scoring good marks for the traits that you want, then they get near the top of the list for, for me to use them as a breeder queen or a queen to rear from. Anyway, let's move on. <clears throat> so the record cards that's allowed, uh, the record card allows us to choose colonies to propagate from and to or to replace. Both are important to be improvement. Queen rearing, every goes a bit blank sometimes. People go a bit blank, especially if you go to a electron queen rearing and they run through about four different methods, you think by the end of it, you don't know if you're coming or going because you've got more confused. So the best is I like to think, start simple and then modify and, and, and adapt and evolve over time. And then you eventually find something that you're really happy with. <clears throat> But the simplest, I think, probably is to perform a split on a colony. And I'll just describe that quickly, not too quickly, to confuse people. And that's a good way of getting some queen cells, especially if you've perhaps only got a couple of colonies. So making up a split, this is what I would do. And there's umpteen ways of doing it. That's the other problem. So from my record, I would select the colony that I want to make a few queens from. I may have two colonies, one which is a bit feisty, perhaps the temper isn't that good, and one which is lovely to handle. And I fancy rearing some more queens from her. So what I do, I check it's healthy and vigorous. It should be a good colony. Health is important because once you start queen rearing, you start spreading things around. So it's not good if there's problems. So first of all, make sure they're healthy and they're a good, strong colony. And now's your chance to mark the queen in the early spring, in sort of April time, when the colony is quite small, perhaps March if you're advanced and you've got a nice day. Mark the queen while it's small, it's much easier to find, and then she'll be easy to find next time. <clears throat> right, this colony is on a single brood box. As soon as they begin getting quite full, perhaps three quarters, two thirds, three quarters full, I can uh, put them on a double brood box, give them another brood box. Now, this might be a box full of foundation. That's an issue in itself, because they've got to draw all that out, use tremendous amount of energy. You may need to feed them. That will encourage them. What I would also do, rec highly recommend, is take a couple of frames of brood from the brood nest in the bottom box and put it into the top box, right in the middle. It's right above the brood in the bottom box. The bees will come up and keep it warm and so on. And they'll be immediately uh, inhabiting two boxes. And the queen will start laying in two boxes and you, you feed in them and they'll draw out the comb and carry on expanding. Now, when the bees are filling two bro brood boxes or just about filling two brood boxes, that's the time when you can come along and make two colonies of them. Yes, you've only got one queen, so that's a bit of an issue. Doesn't matter, you'd split them in two. And this is a great time to get someone to work with you. Work with a colleague if you can, it's so much easier. And you take the two boxes apart <clears throat> and set up, you're going to set up one colony on the new site, which is just next door or whatever, a few yards away. So put one brood box on the new site with a floor and so on. And you want to put the new, the old queen on this new site. So you move the queen away with one of the brood boxes. Okay, so the one on the original site is queenless now. Now you and your colleague have got to go through these brood boxes and make sure you know where the queen is. And you want the queen on the new site. 
And as you already marked her, it will be easier, but it still can take a little while to find her. But you, if you persevere, you'll find her. And then, so what you've got now is the queen on the new site over there. And you've got in the old, on the old site, you've got eggs and young larvae, and you can transfer some frames from the one to the other. So you want to make sure you've got quite a bit of eggs and young larvae on this, on the old site, the original site. And this, this site, don't forget, is queenless. And the good thing about young larvae is they will, as you move them over, they will carry the nurse bees with them. And you want, no, it's not a nurse bees in this, in this colony that's queenless, because nurse bees look after the brood and they rear, they provide the brood food for the new queens that are going to happen. Now, because it's queenless, they're going to be, straight away, they're going to be thinking, they soon realise they're queenless, and they're going to start rearing what we call emergency queen cells. You just leave them alone. What's going to happen to these two colonies while you've gone, when you go away? A lot of the flying bees from the new site, with their, although they've got a queen there, they're going to fly out to forage, and they're going to come back to the site they know which is this site. So they're going to boost the strength of this colony. It's nice and strong now, loads of bees in it. This is a bit weak, but it's got a queen at least, so they'll be all right. Um, this is strong, with loads of bees, loads of food coming in because there's loads of foragers, there's loads of young bees because they're larvae and so on. And the bees will set to, they haven't got a queen, so they desperately want one. They're going to rear queen cells on these eggs. People panic because they think, well, I'm just the rear queens on larvae that are too old. To my mind, they won't if they've got the choice. If they've got eggs and you're very young larvae, they'll choose that. I've no evidence suggests they do any different. <clears throat> Come back in a week's time and you'll find queen cells dotted all over the place on certain frames. And this is your chance to make up nukes with a frame with queen cells, and I'll show you a picture. Um, or you can harvest cells by cutting out of a frame, but what you do is you come back and you find things like this. You find, oh, they've reared some cells. Um, oh, that frame I could put with a few more frames of bees. So this this frame is queenless. All it's this hive is queenless. All it's got is queen cells on various frames. Um, so I'm going to spit it up. There's 11 frames in it. I could bring, get another one from somewhere, for example, make 12 frames. I could spit it into four colonies. If I don't want to do that, I could spit it into two colonies. As long as you've got the equipment, it could either be a brood box or, or some nuke boxes. But what you must make sure is that you put something like this in each one. If you, if you put them in four, say you're spitting in four, and you've only got three frames with queen cells on, you could very carefully cut this out with a sharp knife, scalpel or something, cut that out without damaging it, pop it into one of these if you wish, you can just actually press it onto a comb if you want, but this makes it easy, pop it in there so that it protects it, and you can push that into the comb on a new, on your new nuke that hasn't got any queen cells, and then the queen will hatch out the bottom. And so you've now got four nukes with queen cells in. And you have very exciting because you've got four, potentially four col new colonies. Um, so that's how you do it. And you, you can more or less, if they're in this stage, you can more or less leave them for four weeks. You might be a bit impatient. You might want to just check them, make sure they've got enough bees and so on, especially if you've done them down to three. I mean, if I, I like personally, my preference is to move those four nukes to a new site because then you don't get any drifting back to the old original site and it, they maintain their population and it's easier if you can do that. If you're on the same site I probably wouldn't recommend doing three frame nukes I'd do something bigger. Um, anyway don't forget this is going to be a few days before these hatch out and then the Queen's got to hatch out she should be five days old before she starts flying probably <clears throat> and mating with the drones and it can be two or three weeks before she starts laying so you, 
in all in all, it's usually four weeks before you see anything. And if you don't see anything after four weeks, often it's bad news. The longer it goes on, the more bad news it is, because what will probably happen is if you get anything at all, if the Queen's still present, she'll probably probably be a drone there. But it's only probably anything can happen in bees. Right. So queen rearing is only half the story because you've got the drones to think about and they're a big part of your bee improvement. Um, getting control over mate, some control over matings is an issue. Um, but we will talk about that. It's not impossible. The way people talk, go on about that, they think that's just impossible. You can't do it. But I think you can. So we'll go on to that. And I'll just sh quickly whip through a few pictures, I think. Um, these are what I use for mating my queens, but you, you wouldn't want to start with those. And that's only if you're trying to do a lot. And with a bit of luck in your nukes, you've read, you might find something like this laying away happily. And that's wonderful. You probably won't get four out of four, but you might get, um, you will get some, no doubt about it. So um, conservation or bee improvement, is there a conflict? Um, <clears throat> and sometimes it seems like there is. One thing you're trying to conserve those that native subspecies. On the other hand, you're trying to improve the quality of your bees. But um, why bother conserving the native subspecies just for conservation reasons? Well, it's a very important genetic resource. And co the Collis group really pointed this out, that they were quite worried about the state of the native bees all around Europe, different subspecies, they were in quite a bad way, really. They were very hybridised wherever you go, and that uh, pie chart there is to remind you what the situation is in this country. But they, we should be looking after them. We never know when you know when they're going to be useful, and they're going to. And they, apart from anything else, that biodiversity is vital. As soon as you reverse the diversity of a species. You, they're, they're at increased risk of disaster, basically, because uh, something can come along and wipe the whole lot out. If they're very diverse, the chances of wiping everything out is pretty remote. And on the other hand, how do we improve our bees? Well, back to this quote that Jules Fair came up with, and he thinks the easiest way to do it is to do it within a single subspecies. So do many breeders around the world. I mean, Sue Kobe in America, she really believes you should stick to one subspecies and she does it with the carniola. Of course, America in America, they haven't got a native subspecies, but she still follows the thing. You, you stick to one subspecies and she thinks that's what we should do in this country. Instead of trying to wrestle our way with this lot. Um, so in a way, I believe they they both starting from different places, but they're both heading the same way. <clears throat> so do we start from what we've got or from pure stock? You can argue what you like, but they're both really trying to get to the same place. The problem with a hybridized population is they don't breed true. Uh, someone asked me what that meant the other day, and it means the offspring doesn't particularly resemble the parents. They can be anything. And that's particularly true of F1 hybrid seeds, and that's a good example. It's the same in things you can, you might get a wonderful bee, produces 200 pounds of honey, and they're, they're good tempered, but they're very mixed. And when you try and breed something from them, the chances of getting something equally good are very remote because it's hybridized. Um, <clears throat> native strain naturally dominates. Uh, we don't know why, but we have our suspicions. Um, we think it mates in cooler weather, almost certainly, which we get a lot of cooler weather. If we get lots of fine settled weather in the summer, um, it's not so important, but because our weather is very changeable, we get lots of cool weather. And uh, that sounds for pre vicinity mating, a pre vicinity mating, which the native bee is thought to do. It tends to mate quite close to home and the drones fly out when the queen flies out. And it's not so dependent on really fine settled weather. Um, these may be, may be factors, I'm not saying they are, I just think, I suspect they are. 
Every time we import foreign subspecies, we're maintaining a hybridized population, which is not making it easy for anyone who wants to improve their bees. And I just want to mention that we have launched, Biba has launched a national bee improvement program. And its aim really is to reduce the demand for imports. So there is an alternative to import and to improve the quality of our bees. We think we can achieve those aims. Um, I thought I'd just th throw a few photos in because it gets a bit dull listening to text all the time. I'm just looking at text. So these are some Cornish bees that, that, um, that was a swarm actually that arrived on a bait hive um, for me and I just photographed them. And that's pretty typical of a native bee in appearance. This tends to be, some people call it ginger, yellowy brown, whatever you want to call it, the hairs around there. These light colored stripes tend to be quite thin in comparison with the dark, unlike carniolum, which sometimes you get quite, carni quite dark carnica bees, but the, the light colored stripe is very wide compared to the dark colored bit, or, you know, it's equally wide, should we say. And there's some more. And what I'm looking for when I try and, uh, select a colony for breeding. You might totally disagree with this, not want anything to do with it, but I'm looking at these worker bees and assessing, do they all look the same? And that counts for quite a lot in my system <clears throat> because I know they're quite uniform and they might be genetically diverse, but they're not too diverse. They're not hundreds of different subspecies in here or, you know, numerous subspecies. And they're all the same subspecies and that looks quite promising to me because if I rear queens from this one, the chances are the next generation will look the same, assuming they mate with bees in the, of these subspecies. And that's the queen. And that's the end of that. I think I'm, I said I'd talk for three quarters of an hour a minute ago. It's nearly an hour. So I think I'll stop there for questions and answers. And there will be, we will be trying to answer the other half of the question about drones and so on, which is equally important next week. But anyway, far away. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now, I think. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned that one because we have had um, a question or two about drones. Well, we uh, can ask them, but uh, if it, I might say you have to wait till next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stay tuned for next week. Uh, first one um, is, um, how is it best to maintain genetic material, especially if you only have one or two hives? Yeah, very good question. And it's very difficult. It's no good pretending it's not. And it's even more difficult if you happen to be surrounded or if your beekeeping neighbors are trying to achieve something different to you. In other words, if they're trying to keep bringing in new stock all the time, that is probably the worst thing. It makes it more and more difficult for you. If your neighbouring beekeepers are just making do with local, shall we say, and you stand a more chance of making the most of it, um, because what you're selecting will be similar to what they're selecting. Well, they might not be selecting at all, but um, the other answer, and that's not very helpful for people who've only got a couple of colonies in a way, because it's you're thinking, well, as I say, it is half the genes you're responsible for, though, because you're doing the queen lines but you're not having much scope for doing anything with the drone lines. <clears throat> the answer really is to get together with other like-minded beekeepers in your, probably in your local association or wherever you meet your local beekeepers and um, see who thinks along the same lines as you. Between you, you can, you can do queen ring between you. You can uh, try and identify an area which would be great for mating your bees. And we're all in different areas and it's quite difficult in many, many areas. It's not brilliant around here, but I am lucky in some ways. So I'm quite happy with the way it is around here now. Um, but if you can work with others, you've got more resources. You can choose your colonies to rear, they're going to rear the drones and produce plenty of, as many drones as you can between you and mate your queens all in this area. You may have to travel, but that's, well, we'll talk more about that next week. It's a good question. Yeah, and, and Biba does have Biba groups as well, so... Um, Absolutely. Biba favours groups. They try to encourage groups, and it, it makes a big difference to the small-scale beekeeper. Excellent. Um, 
does uh, breeding from uh, a gentle queen depend on the genetics of the drones the queen mates with? That's a good question. I probably don't know the answer in a way, but um, it's hard to say where, you know, you can breed from a, you can breed from a gentle queen. And certainly I find that most of the offspring are gentle as a result. It does help for me because I have managed to develop a sort of a uni fairly uniform strain. I think that helps. I mean, you can prove me wrong. You can try and breed from anything. I mean, I, I didn't get around to it one time. I was going to breed from a, I had a super colony. They were totally hybridized and they weren't very nice tempered, but they did produce tons of honey. And we hear that story a lot, but um, I was going to experiment by rearing a few queens from her. Um, this was just an idea I had. It didn't actually manifest. I didn't do it, unfortunately. It would have been very interesting to see what the offspring was like. And I would ex have expected the offspring to be very variable. I doubt if any would have lived up to her, but I can't say that for sure. It would have been an interesting experiment. I might try that if I get that opportunity again. But um, though we don't really know where the temper comes from. If it, I think it's something to do with it. I suspect a lot of it is to do with the queen's pheromones um, rather than but uh, no, I really am um, just speculating on, on with no evidence, really. So I'll have to leave that to more expert people than me. Okay, okay. Uh, Jeff wanted to know um, if you were to take a F0 Bookfast Queen and you were to breed down the line, how far down the line would you have to go before you could use the definition of a locally adapted um, strain? That's a very nice question. Again, it's a, it's a good one. I always. The difficult ones are always the best. <laughs> the ones that really make you think. But, um, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the subspecies, it has evolved over thousands of years in this country since the Ice Age, basically. The Ice Age retreated. And, and that's the question of thousands of years of changing. Okay, conditions may have changed in that time, but, but I'm not suggesting it's that long. I think they become locally adapted after a, a, a number of generations. But what you, the first thing you notice, um, you often notice with a, a lighter colored queen, people buy a nice light colored queen, the temper's lovely. And then it goes, the next generation goes a bit darker and then they go a bit darker and they say, oh God, these black bees are horrendous. And that isn't really a, what you call a black bee, that's a hybridized bee. And it's, it has crossed with the local bees. The, the black bees tend to dominate. So gradually they become stronger and more, they're more, of the, more genetically of them, if you like. Um, that's not answering the question. Come back to the question. Uh, how many generations as well? I think you've just got to try it for yourself. And certainly they do become locally adapted. They're going to change quite a bit from your original Buckfast. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say with this darkening and so on. The temper might go off. But funnily enough, if you keep going, uh, the temper gets better again after another, after a bit longer because the, the native or the local strain starts to dominate. It seems to be some incapa incompatibility between foreign subspecies and local subspecies, if you like. And that's what I can put it down to. And as the local strain becomes more dominant, it's they sort of mellow out again. Uh, but you have to so often have to go through this horrendous patch first. And personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with going down that road and just keep trying to select and improve what you've got. Uh, because I think nature is on your side. You, If you can work with nature, and by that I mean don't keep bringing new stock in, uh, use what's doing well in your area. And then my theory is that it will get more and more native, actually, uh, is the word. I mean, we can argue about the terminology of local and native and people, some like one, some like the other. But um, it will get more local and it, I'm pretty sure it will be genetically more, more native because of the, we suspect, because of the mating habits, really, in this climate. That, that backs so on quite nicely. It's up to you to experiment. Sorry. 
Sorry, I Sorry, just that, uh, that backs quite nicely onto a question that Cathy's asked about your okay. feelings towards yeah. um, by the, the, the comment that you need to buy a new queen every two or three years to improve stock variation um, yeah. if you're raising queens in a, in a home apiary. Um, what are your thoughts about buying in stock to, to top okay. that up? My thoughts really are fairly negative and I know this is what lots of people do as a matter of routine and I can't argue because they probably get good results they like it but what they're not doing is developing a locally adapted bee um, a bee that does well in their particular area their particular climate their particular conditions and that's what I, I like to see I, and I think this system that we're advocating really is it changes as the environment changes, as the climate changes. If if there's local changes, and over time, of course, there will be, because there wouldn't, we're not like we were 150 years ago. And over time, conditions might change, but your bees will also change because you're always rearing from ones that do well in those conditions. So you're you're keeping up with things. You're you're not just imposing something on on the environment. You're actually working with the, the best thing in the environment. So. Generally, I don't like the idea of bringing in new stock. I didn't like it when Brother Adam told me that was the way to do it, and I don't like it now. Um, sometimes it can be used, but I recommend if you're doing that, um, it would be because you're going with the, the naturally dominant strain of bee in your area, which over time, if there were no imports, I'm pretty sure would be something like a native bee. And you can bring in the same strain of bee to boost up the qualities you're looking for, if you want. I mean, a lot of people like that system. So that is our system, but at least it's compatible with what you're you're doing. Now, I've never done that with my bees and people say, oh, well, I mean, you'll get inbreeding in no time. But of course you don't because <clears throat> there's so many bees around and that's all open mated and they're mating with multiple drones all the time. And you just they haven't really got the opportunity to develop that inbreeding. Okay. Excellent. A couple more questions. Uh, I think this is an important one just to clarify. Jeff wants to know when you score against swarming on your uh, record cards, are you suggesting that you should leave the colony during the season without any proactive swarm management? No, no, sorry. I, I probably missed, I've done, I've made that mistake before. I've misled people on the swarming. No, I, I do practice swarm control. That's why we go in every week to look at our bees. People who clip their queens can go in a bit less frequently than that, but we, we find we need to go in every week uh, during the season. So I don't usually see any swarming. It's usually the first week of May I see the early ones. But anyway, um, we go in from April onwards, really every week. And we <clears throat> we note what they're doing, and obviously, if um, they're rearing queen cells, we we're, we're going to do something about it. We're going to practice some form of swarm control, whatever suits you. It might be removing the old queen with a small nuke. It might be. I wouldn't recommend just bashing the queen cells down because they'll just be back again next week. But occasionally, you're tempted to do that. Occasionally, we do and. You sometimes get away with it because occasionally they don't bother again. Um, but do do your normal swarm control. Don't just let the bees swarm. You'll you'll lose your bees and everything else. But you mark them down for rearing queen cells, basically. So that that's how the system works. Um, and then the um, I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, we've yeah. got two that relate to to drones. Um, you're going to touch on drones next time. Um, so that yeah, you can throw them out if you like. We've had a quickly. how many how many drones are required uh, to be to consider that you have dominated the local area uh, with drones, okay. and um, would you advocate using drone uh, uh, foundation in the brood chamber? Okay, we'll, we we will deal with that next week. So make sure if you don't, you have to ask the same question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Super. Well, uh, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, there are uh, lots and lots of questions. Um, well, I'll try and get them all down and then we can okay. uh, build some of that into, into 
going forward. Thank you all very much for listening and sticking with it and for all your questions. So they are good and they're intelligent questions that make me think, so that's good. But we all have to experiment and find our own answers really, but it's a good place to start. Thank you very much. <laughs>